Hi, I'm Susan Shaner, your host tonight of Community Forum, and I have the great pleasure to introduce to you Lucina Fisher, who is a writer, journalist, and filmmaker. Welcome, Lucina. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. It's so great to have you on the show, and I'm going to brag about you for a minute, so I want, to, I want our viewers to hear a little bit about your bio. So, award-winning writer and filmmaker, drawn to multicultural stories that reflect the resilience of the human spirit, mm. and you're the principal of Little Light Productions, and you've written and produced three nationally broadcast documentaries on Gladys Knight, B.B. King, and the history of Title X, uh, as well as numerous segments for television. Your works appeared on Discovery, A&E, ESPN, National Geographic, Channel, ABC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, and I actually did see one of your, we're going to talk about one of your documentaries tonight, but another one I saw um, a couple years ago, Death in the Family, and that was uh, sort of somewhat autobiographical, right? Yes, that was a short film. Uh, yeah. I had sort of moved into that after having children. Um, I didn't have as much time to produce hour-long documentaries, so yeah. a short film seemed about right <laughs> yeah 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 no that's great yes. um and you you've even done reporting for the miami herald people magazine oh the oprah magazine um articles some of your articles have appeared in the new york times lifetime health um and i know you're working now for abcnews.com right right i worked yeah. for them part-time uh going on nine years so um multi-talented quite an illustrious career <laughs> um and Tonight, specifically, we're going to talk about your documentary, Birthright. But before we get into that, I'm curious about this focus on resilience and the human spirit. How mm. did that kind of become, I don't know if it's your signature, but your focus for your work? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things that evolves, um, as does one's life, right? Um, you know, I started out being very interested in journalism, sitting with my father, watching the news, um, you know, reading whatever I could in the newspaper, loved watching documentaries. Um, so you, were you like, as a kid, were you like a news junkie? I was totally a news junkie. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I always watched ABC News. Um, oh, okay. I remember Barbara Walters. Being, Harry Reasoner? Uh, oh, yeah. Harry Reasoner. Yeah. Um, I remember um, Charles Kuralt on mm -hmm. CBS Morning News. I would get up on Sunday mornings and watch him. <laughs> news nerd. I was totally a news nerd. <laughs> 60 Minutes, loved it. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was something my father and I did together. We would sit down and watch the news. So it was your bonding thing with him? It was totally a bonding thing. Yeah. And, um, and I thought, one day, I'm going to be on the news. I wanted to be the first black Barbara Walters. Fantastic. And then Oprah Winfrey came along. <laughs> I was like, what happened? Okay. Right, Oprah Winfrey came along. So you're like, okay, I can't do that. Uh, well, yeah, she's, she's already done it. Um, but I, I still was so attracted to journalism. And you didn't go in front of the camera. And, uh, well, interestingly, I did start out with a broadcast major. Um, I went to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, go Tar Heels. <laughs> And um, they had a, a, an amazing journalism school. They still do have a, mm -hmm. a great journalism program. And I was very interested in being in front of the camera. One of the first jobs I had was my freshman year uh, reporting uh, the news for a radio station. Oh. Yes, WCHL okay. News. It was an AM station. All right. And uh, the news director there, he's like, I'm going to make you a star. You know, he thought I sounded like the people on NPR. And, and I, how do they sound? Well, you know how they sound. <laughs> <laughs> very, you know, very conversational, but, you know. Getting to the points. Getting to the point, important, you know, mm -hmm. and just that kind of serious yeah. voice. I wasn't your, your sort of fun broadcaster. I was, you know, I was kind of a serious kid when you think about it. I mean, I love to have fun, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yes, I was interested in issues mm -hmm. and um, I found myself getting emotional when I would watch people's stories. I mean I can fully remember those documentaries about the civil rights movement, Okay. the black and white footage yeah. of oh, yeah. the dogs, the hoses being turned loose on people. Yeah. It would bring me to tears and I realized that 
I had a kind of empathy uh, for people's stories, for people's lives, mm -hmm. and had an interest in their stories. And so um, as I went through college, I also, um, you know, I continued to do work in front of the camera. I was the, the host of their, um, the campus um, student television program. We had a news program. Mm. And honestly, Susan, I, I, somebody had put uh, some videos of that online. Don't everybody go rush to find it. Um, <laughs> I was surprised. You're like, oh, there I am in college. Uh, yes, <laughs> I was surprised at how I sounded. I never thought I had a southern accent, but I did in, in this clip. And Very slight. I mean, that's still slight. You slight. know, it comes yeah. out if I'm in the south, certainly. But. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was like, God, I was awful. And I'm sure everybody <laughs> says that, you know, when they're looking back, you know, at footage of themselves. Um, but I had an opportunity to get an internship with the Charlotte Observer. And one of my college professors said, you know, Lucina can write. She just likes being in front of the camera. And back then there was such a division between the people who were on the broadcast side and yeah. people who were in print. Yeah. Today, everybody does everything. Yeah. And let me tell you, I have n a numerous side hustles, as I call them. Yeah. My side hustle right now is being a filmmaker, right? Yeah. You know, um, so you, you moved away from the camera and then you really went into the writing. Into the writing. And I tell you, you know, as, as people have said, it begins with the word. And, and that's whether you're on television, mm -hmm delivering those words or you're reading them in a paper, something that you've written. Mm. Um, it, you know, you tell the story with words. Um, although in documentary and filmmaking, the beauty is being able to put words and picture together and sometimes just allowing the picture to say everything. Yeah, so let's talk about this documentary that you wrote and co-executive produced. Yeah. So um, it's called Birthright, A War Story. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to look at a, a clip of the trailer, but before, before we do that, um, how was this concepted? How did this come to be? Yeah. Because it's really a powerful documentary. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, my partner on uh, the documentary, the director and, and executive producer, Sivia Tamarkin, she and I worked together at People Magazine many years ago. Mm -hmm. oh. um, yes, and um, both of us drawn to social just justice issues. Yeah. Um, Sivia, especially with criminal justice and investigative reporting, I was more into, at one point, I kind of considered myself the death beat reporter because I was always covering death beat. Death beat. Yes, oh. I felt I was oh. always covering sure. some tragedy. Oh. Um, I was good at that. You know, I was I was once again good at, at you know, empathizing with people's tragedies mm -hmm. and giving them the space to open up and talk about their experience mm -hmm. or their loss. Mm -hmm. And um, and so the two of us, you know, worked well together in the Chicago Bureau of People magazine. And um, Fast forward some years later, she's also moved more into television. She worked for ABC News as well, uh, doing some pieces for Nightline. Um, and then she later went to CNN as an executive producer there of their Time um, magazine mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a show with, with Time um, in which reporters all over the world would sort of give dispatches. Um, so you came back in each other's orbits? We came back in each other's orbits and, and I had then gone off and uh, after leaving people got into producing full time which was really I think my my true love. Mm -hmm. um, you know from being a kid watching documentaries that had always been a, a dream of mine to produce documentaries. So I moved to New York actually with the express purpose of um, okay. producing okay. and um, managed to make that transition through again the word. Yeah. Um, I had written a book on Gladys Knight and uh, her memoir and um, later approached her about doing an A&E biography on her. So that was my first uh, hour that I pr produced for television. 
and then that was followed by a documentary on B.B. King. And then Sivia called me up and said, um, I have this commission from ESPN to do the 30-year history of Title IX and women in sports. And um, I'd love for you to work with me. So I produced that. She exec produced it. And it was a fantastic uh, piece that um, actually we uh, had a big showcase in Bristol um, with numerous people involved in sports coming together, a town hall meeting, if you will, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. talk about the issues. There yeah. were a lot of issues around then. So she and I had always sort of, re you know, worked well on these kind of issue-oriented documentaries. So it was after this one you started talking and... Right. Well, with Birthright, um, yeah. it was probably about two and a half years ago, going on three now. Okay. Um, it was right after the Hobby Lobby decision, which was um, in June of 2014, where the Supreme Court essentially said this privately owned company could um, decide, opt out, if you will, f of providing contraception for their employees. Yeah. So this was a huge decision. This was like... Um, a landmark decision and it was a sort of chipping away if you will mm -hmm. at all these rights yeah. um, that women had gained um, during the 60s and 70s. Rights that Sivia who is um, a bit older than I am of a you know a, a different generation she actually was marching and fighting for. Wow. I'm one of the benefactors yeah. right of yeah. that and um, and certainly consider myself a feminist um, yeah. and you know, remember when, um, was it Pat Schroeder ran for president? Mm -hmm. I was in yeah. college then. Yep. And so, you know, I was supporting her. And so I, you know, have a long history of certainly supporting women's rights. Um, but yes, yeah, Sivia was on the front lines. and, and um, So you started talking about we have to do something about this? Well, and it sort of absolutely. Kind there. of like yeah. what is going on? Yeah. You yeah. Know, that and was, we have to tell these stories. Right. The, first, the yeah. first thing was why is this happening? Yeah. You know, and, and as journalists, you sort of, you know, don't draw conclusions until you kind of get all the facts. Yeah. And so we just sort of followed the dots, if you will, and connected them. And what we saw was a bigger picture of uh, really a long assault on not only women's right to choose, but women's medical decision making, their control over their bodies, um, tying the hands of the doctors to be able to provide care for them. Yeah. It's much bigger. I, I wonder if we, yeah, the, the documentary I just saw it the other day with my partner, he and I were like, oh my God, it yeah. is so incredibly powerful. And what it really does is lay out, all, not just the black and white of, are you pro-choice or are right. you pro-life, but all these shades of gray, and you do a great job of laying out all these different scenarios and really make it real the heart-wrenching things that have happened to these women. Right. So maybe let's, do you want to go to the clip? Yes. And then we can talk further? Sure. Okay, so let's go to the clip. We have a clip of the trailer, actually. Mm -hmm. So let's see what we have here. I don't want to have oh my God. a C-section. She didn't sign anything. What's going on here? How can they just be rolling her down the hallway into the operating room? I look out the window and there's three officers. They wanted to know if I had an unlawful miscarriage. The law should not have affected me at all. It was 10 days of torture. Over at the door, he comes in, he's getting out of the handcuffs. Katie was taken to the jail. She was still bleeding from having the baby. There's a woman miscarrying. She needs help completing the miscarriage medically, and there's a doctor on the phone with a bishop. Why? Catholic bishops should not be dictating medical care to doctors and patients. It is a very scary time <laughs> in the United States right now for a woman to become 
pregnant. Women, from the moment they carry a fertilized egg, can be deprived of their right to liberty. What we're seeing is where the states and courts are increasing their control over whether and when and how women give birth. It's an attempt to erode women's civil rights without calling it that. We're currently suffering from a public health crisis from a number of forces that all bearing down on women. There are a lot of people who simply don't know that they could possibly be next. Wow. <laughs> I mean, seeing that trailer again after watching the movie and the first story, not to give it away, but it's the story that you end with in the documentary. Yes. Which was so incredibly heart wrenching. Right. Right. I mean, this woman does not want to have this C section and saying, no, I don't. And, and he's making her. She, She's he's literally wheeled down to the, uh, <coughs> emerge, to the surgical room. To the she didn't room. sign anything. There was no yeah. medical reason why she had to have yeah. it. Her story is just horrific. And, and you have to think this could never happen to a man because there is legal precedent that shows that uh, it actually, it, through a case that went to the Supreme Court, um, no person can be forced to have a surgery even if it's something that's life-saving to them, they, they cannot be forced to have a surgery for themselves or for any other person. But the only instance in which this seems to be the exception is a pregnant woman. There, there, there are things that seem to not apply to pregnant women. I mean, not only the facts and the story, mm -hmm. but the way that the pregnant woman and her um, doula, yeah. explain how it all happened. The man, it's incredibly abusive. Right. And the man was very angry. Right. And of course, right. won't ruin it for the viewers, but um, <clears throat> he ends up being negligent in the, in the surgery. Right. And, you know, our point in including something like that is that not only is this happening, and we know that, you know, C-sections are on the rise and yeah. continue to be and they do put women more at risk yep. for, you know, numerous mistakes happening or, you know, even their lives at risk. Mm. Um, but our point is, is that when you put the, the child or even the fetus first and make it so paramount and important, you forget the mother or There's the woman there. behind it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And like, how do you weigh this? Um, which, which is more important? Which, which is more important, yeah. and and you, you shouldn't <laughs> have to make that choice. Yeah. Certainly, no legislature or court should have to make that choice. That choice should have to be should be made, really, between a doctor and the woman and her family. Now, obviously, this is a really hot topic today with the political climate, yeah. and looking at this documentary depending on what side of the fence you are, pro-life, pro-choice, you do interview some pro-life experts. Oh, yeah. Um, they were happy to talk to us. Um, you know, it's so interesting. We actually struggled to find um, victims to come forward um, and yeah, how did you doctors and advocates. Yeah. You know, because um, people were afraid to talk about this. I think... Um, really the, the pro-life or anti-abortion side really feels like they're in a very strong position right now and that they are sort of winning this war, if you will, and have no problem with sharing uh, their strategy or um, the fact that they are here and they're not going anywhere. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the fact that it's declared a war. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, uh, as, as one of the people says in our film, um, it's as if you're trying to defeat the communists. You bring everything to bear. So think about that, you know, that, right. th that they're going after... Guerrilla war tactics, kind it, of. It, absolutely. And, and <clears throat> you know, another person mentioned the last time, you know, an issue divided the country this strongly or people felt this strongly about an issue 
we shot each other to doll rags on the Civil War battlefield. Yeah. There is a lot, we did not create this war motif. This was what was being talked about in these interviews. It emerged from your interviews. Absolutely, absolutely. How did you identify the victim, I hate to use the word victim, but really the victims? Sure, they are, they are victims. Yeah. They're victims of these laws. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as the one husband of mm. uh, Danielle Deaver puts it, um, you know, this, this should not have affected us. You know, this law, this law, you know, basically put his, li his wife's life at risk. And, and what was so heart-wrenching with that, too, is that even the medical personnel were saying, we don't want to do this, but we're obligated by the law. We, we, we could go I mean, to prison. Ha she has a baby that's totally not viable. She has to. She stay basically with has it. to carry this baby Terrific. until either the heartbeat stops, or her life is so endangered that they have to induce labor, and it essentially got. And there's to no the way point. it's viable anyway. No. Yeah. And it, it essentially got to the point where she was so ill, she did managed to go into labor naturally, but by that time she was so ill from the infection that had developed from having her membranes ruptured for 10 days that she did nearly die, that her husband nearly lost her, and they haven't been able to have another child since. So that's the other piece that who knows what that infection may have the caused. Damage, right. it, yes, the damage it may have caused and made it difficult to conceive again or to carry another t pregnancy to term. Um, so, you know, we found people through many serendipitous ways. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as journalists, we're, you know, you, you're just constantly digging and making calls and someone reaching or, out. Absolutely. Yeah. As it turned out, the Deavers, um, Ha, their story had been told before in, uh, on ABC News' website, and the person who interviewed them was actually one of my colleagues at ABC. Oh, okay. So I was able to call her up and say, oh, I really want to speak to the Deavers. Do you still have their information? She's huh. like, absolutely. And, and uh, when I contacted Danielle Deavers, she was like, when, how soon can you come? You know, she was eager to talk so about we're, this. So the folks that you interviewed, have they seen the documentary now? They haven't seen the documentary yet. And um, the documentary will be released, uh, we're looking at mid-July. So they didn't have a, a private showing? Or no, anything. they haven't okay. had a private showing yet. Okay. And, um, you know, I'm very excited to share it with them. And I, I think, you know, you rightfully pointed out that these stories are so compelling. Ugh. And it was important yeah. for us to again bring the emotional impact home to people. Well, you really did that. You really captured it. I mean, it, I you. was so, um, so moved, so disturbed. I could barely sleep. So, so, wow. so outraged that not only could this be happening in first world country, in our country, but in this day and age, it just felt so barbaric and these women feeling so incredibly helpless. Right. They could, there's nothing they yes. can, and they're, they're partners. Um, so. And it's happening all across the country. I mean, the yeah. woman you mentioned with the C section, she's in New York, she's in Brooklyn. Um, Danielle Deaver is in the middle of the country in Nebraska. Yeah. Um, so we have people from a real cross section, the South, um, yeah. someone from the West. And um, it was. It just sort of happened that way, mm -hmm. but the point is that this is happening all over the country, not just in states with Republican governors, uh, of which there are 33. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot has changed, obviously, since the election, but we completed this film prior to the election, wow. which, is, which is kind of interesting. It really became um, a harbinger of what was to come. You know, we did not know who was going to win the election. Yeah. We were just simply so could saying. Be accelerating a little bit. Oh, so, I think so. So we have about three more minutes, and I, I just, um, what are the channels in which this, this film's going to be released? Sure. So, yes, we're, we're starting out with a theatrical release. Okay. Um, so it will premiere in the New York uh, area. 
In uh, major theaters? In, 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 in major theaters, yes. Okay. At prop, most likely a couple of theaters in the city, in New York City. Okay. Um, we'll do a one-week engagement. That'll be followed by Los Angeles and San Francisco, Chicago, um, and possibly Washington, D.C. I think that would be a good place, too, for this to, to, to run. And then we will also run it in limited engagements, sort of one or two nights uh, in 20 cities across the country in Canada. Um, because it's so compelling. I just hope that you have oh, some, some it, good oh, distribution. Oh, absolutely. So that's only the first tier of the distribution. After that, we're actually working with a marketing team because for us, the point of this film is for as many people to see it as possible. So, so we're going to be doing community screenings. We'll be okay. doing screenings on campus. Um, great. Groups can request the film. Um, oh, great. You know, I think it'll be a great fundraising tool. It's a great conversational tool. And it's a great advocacy tool to get people moving and action taken. Absolutely, I mean, it's gonna be a great catalyst to foster some of these intense dialogues that have already been taking place in our country, but a little more focused. Absolutely. So we have like one minute. Yes. Um, so do you have like just a headline if somebody wanted to get involved from an activist standpoint, what could they could do? Oh, absolutely. I, I, will, I hope that they will look up Birthright Film, okay. um, which is uh, our website, and we have a newsletter there. They can sign up for the newsletter, and that will give them more information about upcoming screenings and when the film will be available also on digital, iTunes or Amazon, oh, great. Netflix, exactly. That's part of the plan? That will be down the line. And, you know, of course, we'd love as many people to come to the theater as possible. But you can read more information about the people in the film, myself, the other filmmakers who are involved in the film. That's Birthright Film. And, of course, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Okay, so birthrightfilm.com. Mm -hmm. And if anybody was an aspiring writer, journalist, or filmmaker and they had any questions for you personally, is there a way in which they could reach you? Um, that I'm also on Twitter. Um, okay. And so, yes. What's your handle? My, my handle is <laughs> Lucina Fisher. You know, there's only one okay. as far as I know. Okay, okay. <laughs> that we could, there's so much more I could say. Maybe we might have to have you on again. Thank you so much this for coming so on the show. so fun. Thank okay. you, Susan. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Susan Shaner. Until next time, thank you for joining us with Community Forum.